Okay, I feel like I'm off the uh, kilter a little here. But you know what? It's been a long day. I don't care. Hey folks, my name is Jen and I am here today to talk to you very quickly about everything that I read in April. Shit. That is the fifth time that has happened, so mm, patience is thin. So a very good thing is that my reading slump is over because I have managed to read um, several books this month, as you can see. So uh, I have tried to keep this pretty short and sweet because I know I like to ramble, so let's just get right into this. So the first thing I read in April was Digging Up Love by Chandra Bloomberg. This was on my um, most anticipated reads of the year list. It's a romance novel featuring small town baker Alicia um, who has like these really big dreams to open her own um, cookie shop in the big city but she is stuck in her very small rural predominantly white town. Uh, where her grandma grandparents have raised her and her sister. Um, enter Quentin, a paleontologist from Chicago who comes out to investigate a bunch of dino bones that were recently dug up in the back of her grandparents' house. Sparks fly. So this was fairly cute and funny. Um, I felt also a little emotional at times um, with the scenes involving her grandparents because like grandparent stories get to me sometimes. Um, I also really enjoyed Quentin's grad students. I thought they were a quirky, fun bunch. As for the main couple though, I enjoyed them when they were getting along. <laughs> uh, however, their whole getting together process was such a slow burn and was also rife with miscommunication and really immature fights or interactions um, with each other which were based upon that miscommunication and like at this point I'm just very much over that as a uh, legitimate uh, reason to have conflict in romance novels and just really like, it's been done, it's been done to death, and please can we just move on from it, basically. I really enjoy that aspect of it, and also there are, like, no steamy bits in here whatsoever. Um, there's a couple of maybe edging towards steamy bits, but they're, like, make-outs, which they're basically just a couple of kisses, and then fade to black or nothing happens and you get the sense that nothing really happened anyway so it's not like you know we're missing out on anything but still I mean not every romance novel out there needs to have sex scenes but I it's also the norm for that to be a thing so I feel like any book that doesn't have that like sexy time payoff needs to note it or have like some kind of symbol on it somewhere that can tell us that this is a virginal love story because um, this was a major disappointment. That was like, I mean, not that I only read romance novels for the steamy bits, but it's like an added bonus to the novel. So for there not to be any payoff felt like this just fell flat overall. I did end up giving this four stars though because I feel like maybe I'm just being way too harsh about it because I did enjoy the writing other than the extremely immature uh, fights that the two had over miscommunications. Those weren't fun either but yeah. Um, if you are someone who is looking for a um, uh, romance novel about a couple of Catholics falling in love and not having sex, then maybe check this out, but um, yeah, I, I scored it high because I think I'm being too harsh on it, but I also just like, there was no horizontal cha-cha and I was very disappointed and this was sad because this was on my anticipated list. 
So then I actually listened to two audiobooks um, while I was working. Um, my job is very much uh, where I have a lot of alone time, I guess. Um, there's aspects of it where interaction, you know, is necessary, but I also spend a lot of it kind of on my own doing my own thing. Um, so we're allowed to listen to, you know, stuff on our earbuds. So usually I listen to podcasts or music, but yeah, I decided to listen to a couple of audiobooks and that was actually pretty fun. I don't think I'll do that too, too often because I end up paying a little more attention to the books <laughs> than what I'm doing, which is not great. But yeah, anyway, uh, the two books that I read, basically. Uh, the first of which was The Mysterious Affair at Styles. They were both Agatha Christie novels. Also, um, so I had never read The Mysterious Affair at Styles before. So I, I mean, I was hooked from the very beginning. Uh, this was Agatha Christie's very debut novel and it was also the first appearance of Hercule Poirot, um, as well as Captain Hastings. Uh, Poirot in that, uh, volume was a recent refugee from World War One. He has moved with a bunch of other um, refugees from Belgium to the English countryside. He ends up being caught up in a murder investigation of um, the his wealthy elderly uh, benefactor when an old friend from um, the war, like pre-war I think, Hastings, asks uh, Poirot for help. So something that struck me at the beginning of the novel uh, was how similar Hastings is to Dr. Watson and how similar like the setup was for like his origin story and, and varying things, um, which was an interesting tidbit. Um, but it also makes sense considering that Agatha Christie was like a super fan of um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So she was always very much into the Sherlock Holmes stories, so she would probably get some inspiration from there for Hastings. Minus him not, totally not being a doctor, but yeah. Uh, I really liked this intro to both Hastings and Poirot. Uh, Poirot really... What was interesting about him, he got into many things, like he's very hands-on. Uh, looking for clues, investigating things, uh, which was interesting to see really because he's more of the sit down armchair detective, let me think with my little gray cells kind of man later on. Um, I mean, he was still that man now, but he just, he, he sniffed things and looked at things and touched things and did all kinds of stuff. He wasn't just sitting back and thinking and then asking pointed questions or going to different places and asking pointed questions like, he is later. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, the weaving of all of the characters and their interconnected issues, um, weaving that all together, that was brilliant. The ending solution was also really brilliant. Um, sometimes I luck out with her mysteries and get kind of close to the killer or I have guessed the killer a couple of times but I just wasn't. I had no idea how they freaking did it. Um, but I, I guess totally wrong as to who the murder was. I was totally off, off kilter entirely, but had to say like hats off again to Dame Agatha. Uh, I gave that five stars. And the second audiobook I listened to, also Agatha Christie, was Crooked House. Um, Crooked House is about old Aristide Leonides who has just passed mysteriously. And the question is, which of his so-called loving relatives poisoned him? So this audiobook was actually read by um, Hugh Fraser, who played Hastings in the original, was it 1980s, I think, show? I think it was BBC, technically. I could be really wrong. I know that I used to watch it on PBS, and I watch it now on YouTube. It's all on YouTube, by the way. So, um, David Suchet is like Poirot, it's a great show, it's lovely. Uh, so I had like the added delight of listening to the audiobook read by him, he is very good at it and he does a pretty decent accent for Poirot. 
Uh, Crooked House is also my second favorite Christie novel, my first being Murder on the Orient Express. Um, so it was also a real treat to read it again because it's been like a couple of years since I've read it. Um, I just, I love everything about this book. The setup, the setting itself, the complicated family dynamics, um, the characters themselves are all very interesting people, all very flawed human beings. I love the main narrator and like the solution, the way it ends, like it's just just absolute brilliance again and I gave that five stars because it's like I said it's my second favorite of hers and I just adore it. Then the next book that I read was The Thinking Machine by Jacques Futrelle, the collection of mystery short stories featuring Professor S.F.X. Van Dusen who is known as The Thinking Machine. He is the OG egghead scientist, um, one of the most brilliant minds of the Edwardian era. The Edwardian era is basically is it coming to an end around now, something like that. Yeah, he solves mysteries like a machine with this mechanical uh, deduction, wowing everyone around him, including uh, one of his hanger-ons, his sometime friend, uh, news reporter Hutchinson Hatch, who records all of his stories. So I'll keep my little review and thoughts of this fairly short because I did already post a video um, going a little more in depth about uh, the characters and the novel and my thoughts on it. Um, I talked about it in my Titanic video because Jacques Futrell was actually um, one of the victims of the sinking, so I talk about like the Titanic and everything and also this book in there, so if you're interested in that, um, I'll probably attach it to this video so you can take a look at it at the end. Yeah. Uh, um, anyway, I really liked these stories. Uh, they were quite brilliant, though definitely, um, Harlan Ellison, who does the intro to this and has helped kind of compile these into this collection, uh, he calls Futrell a one-trick pony. Um, his stories get very formulaic after a while. So they do, they do kind of follow this formula, i.e. formulaic, but that has never been a problem with me. I love formulaic mysteries, um, have always done that. I devour like mystery and like detective and cop shows like Criminal Minds and NCIS and you know reruns of like older shows that did the same kind of thing like I love that stuff it's very there's something very comforting about knowing that at the end of it they're gonna figure out who done it and put them away and blah 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 you know so I don't mind stuff like that so like yeah I don't really mind that but Overall, I did find them to be fairly brilliant, uh, though somewhat dated. <laughs> uh, the Thinking Machine also has a tendency to make almost omnipotent, like, realizations. Like, even realizations that's like, how did you even get to this point? That's not even impossible uh, without you knowing things because the author created you. But at the same time, it was still so entertaining and the characters themselves kind of grew on me by the end of the collection. And yeah, I was just thoroughly entertained by this. It was pretty great. I gave this five stars. Then I read Pride and Prejudice, the manga by Jane Austen. Uh, this story adaptation was by Stacey King and the art is by Poe Say. Uh, this is your favorite tale of Lizzie Bennet and Mr. Darcy, but in, uh, you know, drawing form. So I loved this a lot. Um, I didn't really need a palate cleanser after Great Mysteries, but it just felt nice to sink my teeth into this. Um, as soon as I found out that this thing existed, I knew that I had to have it <laughs> and read it. Um, the humor was perfect. If you are someone who regularly consumes manga or um, anime, then you know, you'd probably get some more of the humor than I suppose if you weren't 
like a regular consumer of that, although I think you would still appreciate it overall. Um, I thought this ad adaptation was just so well done and, and absolutely lovely, and can I just say, like, Darcy. Oh, should I even show you this? I should show you this. I'm just gonna show you this. Like, hot damn, Darcy. Damn. So if you are someone who is kind of afraid, oh, holding it wrong, haha, <laughs> if you are someone who's kind of afraid of actually sitting down and picking up one of these novels because you're very intimidated by classics or just Jane Austen or Regency era books, etc. You're a little nervous about that kind of thing, but you do really want to read it. But again, classics are scary. You know, I think that this is a really good way to introduce you to this classic and maybe you'll see that it isn't that scary and you can actually read the actual thing or maybe this is how you want to consume classics and that's totally valid too because at least you are reading them and you're reading. Um, yeah, if you want to do that, I highly recommend this. I plan on seeking out the others in uh, this collection, not all of them because some classics I just never want to read again or I'm not interested. But uh, they have a version of Count of Monte Cristo and I desperately need to get my hands on it. So uh, you will probably see more of these manga classics in the future. Um, but yeah, this was wonderful and I gave this five stars. Then I read How to Find a Princess by Alyssa Cole. This is book two in the Runaway Royals series, which is her new series, which is kind of an offshoot of the Reluctant Royals series. Um, so this is featuring first off Makeda. Makeda is not having the greatest of times right now. Her life is kind of falling apart, sort of. She just lost her job and her girlfriend. She's had to move back in with her grandmother and her life is turned even more upside down after an investigator from the World Federation of Monarchists shows up and tries to convince her and her grandmother that she is indeed the long lost uh, heir to the throne of Iberania. So Makeda's life is about to get so much more complicated, uh, especially considering also that the investigator, Vesnaria, is really determined to get her back to Iberania and also is really attractive. So the two end up going on this like boat trip and there's like this quirky crew just full of shenanigans. I really loved that aspect of it. Uh, Alyssa Cole basically did it again. Uh, steamy scenes, of course. Not maybe as many steamy scenes as I was hoping for, but still steamy scenes. Uh, this healthy relationships, there is communication, um, there is some like miscommunication but it's not like a crazy amount of it. Uh, I honestly admit that I wasn't always fond of Makeda. Um, in the early parts of the book I found her to be kind of bouncing between a doormat and abrasive so I wasn't I wasn't particularly fond of her but she grew on me and her like growth over the course of the book was also pretty good to like see as well. Bez was a delight. She is odd and that is great. Um, the whole wacky like ship crew too was also a delight. I kind of wish that maybe there would have been even more of them um, but yeah, they were one of the best parts of the novel as well. Um, the one thing, other than wishing for a little bit more of certain people, was that the ending felt a little bit rushed. Um, we got to like things pretty quick and then it was just like, oh, here we are. Um, so I felt like there could have been more build up or maybe just a little bit longer things other than like here in the action and now we're done. Um, but other than that, this was like a really solid read 
and I really enjoyed it and I gave this four stars. So then I read Four Centuries of Great Love Poems by various uh, poets. This is just a collection of love poems. Um, this was something that I bought at like Borders. Oh, Borders. Yeah, back in like high school. Probably because we just read Shakespeare in class and I was like, I want to read more things. Um, yeah, I grabbed this from my parents' house and decided to give it a reread. Uh, well, there were quite a few poems that I actually really enjoyed and also quite a few that I remembered, you know, liking as a teenager based on the pages that I, are, the corners are turned down because I wanted to remember them, apparently. Uh, there were also quite a few poems that I really disliked. The Shelley poems I absolutely loathed, but honestly that's my usual reaction to Percy Bly Shelley. I find him just the worst. Um, there was an entire section dedicated in here to like unrequited love and that got a bit tedious because it's so freaking overly dramatic and I was, I, I think I like ended up skipping the last like four poems because I was just like I cannot read another line about these people and their over dramatic bullshit. Um, when this like says four centuries they mean a lot of like really old poems like they they do mean really old poems there's not like anything modern in here so if you're hoping for something from the 20th century you're not going to find it um really i don't think no i lied robert frost is in here but when they mean the 20th century, they don't mean, like, you know, anything post the turn of the century, pretty much. Uh, so if you're not a fan of big flowery poems, you're not really a fan of, like, older poems, I might suggest you maybe skip this one. If you are a fan of that kind of thing, or you just want to see what other people are writing about love so many years ago, maybe this is a thing for you. Uh, there definitely could have been more of a variety of the poets in here. Uh, there, there wasn't. There was a lot of repeats of very, um, various poets, and it just felt like they could, they could have expanded. Like it wasn't just dusty white people writing about love back in the day. You could have expanded your horizons into like other countries and cultures and included them as well, but they just did not choose to do that. They went with the classics. So here we have it. Um, I still gave it four stars because I feel like I'm being a grump about this. I think I was still feeling some type of way about, you know, disappointing love things, so I was a little grumpy. Um, they are a classic for a reason, even though I can't stand a couple of the poets that wrote things in here, but I was, I'm just, I'm being too mean. Is what I'm saying. I still gave it four stars. Though, so, if you're like me and you don't like flowery stuff, maybe skip it. So then I picked up Gallant by V.E. Schwab. So Gallant is following Olivia. Uh, Olivia basically knows nothing of her past and family except that which is scribbled in her mother's journal which contains creepy ink drawings and also just journal entries slowly slipping off into madness. When a letter comes to her boarding school, which is pretty much the only world she's ever known, um, this letter summons her back home to the family manor of Gallant. There are many more secrets that she has to find out uh, back there amongst her family. So this novel is interesting in the fact that <laughs> This is another one of Schwab's books where I'm not fully sure how I feel about it. Um, while I was thoroughly entertained while I was reading this, and I was on the edge of my seat because I mean, we've, and it's beautiful. Like, look at the, like the journal entries in here, and then hold on, let me show you the the 
ink drawings like that's very beautiful it's very beautifully put together you know it, it's very like creepy I had to double check this because I thought originally someone had said oh this is for a younger audience and I was like this can't be because some of the details that are written in here are kind of gross by the way if you are someone who has problems with like descriptions of dead people and like death things maybe just keep that in mind when you're reading this because that was in there and I was not expecting that um but yeah uh so I mean this was really creepy like I had to set it down so I didn't read it at night because I didn't want to be creeped out by it but I mean despite that and despite me being thoroughly entertained and despite really life loving like Olivia, she's so feisty. Um, I also really liked, uh, you know, the detail that she is actually mute. She does not have the ability to speak. Uh, so she communicates um, sometimes by writing, but also through sign language um, with people who know how to, how to use that as well. So it's like, I liked that kind of aspect about it because I don't feel like that's not, um, not a trait of uh, a lot of main characters that you'll see, so I, I enjoyed that. Um, and I really liked her because she's very feisty and and everything, and she sees ghosts, man, like that. Love that. But I mean, ultimately, I think it was the ending. Like I wasn't fully on board with how it ended, I guess. And I don't know, I. This is like the third book of hers at this point where it has ended and I just feel off kilter. And I won't say like disappointed because it's not really like disappointment, but I just feel off. I just feel like I was hoping for something else and that's just, that's not what I got really. Or... I don't know how to explain it other than just saying that, but that's, this is, yeah, the third book of hers now where I, I enjoy the experience thoroughly, but then at the end of it, I'm just like, I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, I don't know what that is, really. I just don't know what that is. Um, I did give it four stars because I, like I said, I loved it. I think it's very well put together. I think it's, um, it's freaking gorgeous and you know, but yeah, I just, I don't, I don't know. Is it ennui? Is that what she's making me feel? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. So then I did a reread of The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. But this book, if you didn't know, uh, follows Mary Lennox after Mary's parents die of cholera in India she's been raised her whole life the sickly and somewhat bratty little girl is sent to her uncle's yorkshire manor of missilewaith there mysteries the land the people and a very special robin will change the life forever of this very unloved child so first of all there are tidbits of racism and colonialism in this book mostly in the beginning that is obviously not great um in context of the time, the author apparently thought that those were necessary tidbits to put in this children's novel. Uh, they're not, but they, the details do give the reader kind of an idea of what the time period was like in which this, this book took place, because I believe that what England was still in control of India at that point, I think. I am so sorry. I'm really bad at world history. They don't really teach you a lot of that in the U.S. education system most of the time. Um, so, point of it is, that's not great. Just wanted to put that out there. That's in here. Um, it's in, like, the beginning parts, and then we get into more, like... Just a charming story about a girl and a garden. Uh, Mary is not really a nice kid in the beginning. 
of the book, but the point is made that she doesn't really have control over that, technically, because um, she didn't really know any better. She was raised by uh, servants who were told by her parents to obey her every word and give her everything she wants as long as she is not anywhere near them. Uh, her parents never wanted anything to do with her, basically did not acknowledge her existence. They are extremely selfish, self-centered, and neglectful as hell, and just didn't really love this kid at all. Um, which is like, well, why did you have a kid then? Like, what was wrong with you? So Mary, from like, her beginning of her existence was given this message that like, she is unlikable and unlovable and basically acted accordingly. Uh, to watch her growth over this novel is just really beautiful. Like her coming to life, like the moors of Yorkshire and like the secret garden, it's just, the juxtaposition of them is just so beautiful and like touching. Then there's also Dickon, the animal charming boy, uh, He's the best character in the novel. He is one of the best characters ever. I love him with my whole heart and soul. The end. So I gave this reread four stars. Then I read Beltane. Uh, this is by... Hold on. They don't write it on the outside. Uh, this is by Melanie Mark. He, um, this is just one of the books of the Llewellyn Sabbath Essentials, uh, containing rituals, recipes, and lore for Beltane or Mayday. Um, like the others I've read in this collection so far, I really enjoyed it. I found this very useful and fun and informative. Um, I liked hearing the history of certain uh, events and festivals and things, as well as like reading about festivals that are still happening, some of that are really cool, um, and a few practices. Uh, we tried a few of the recipes, they were delicious, and uh, yeah, this was just fun and informative, and I gave this five stars. And the last book that I read in April was The Wedding Dilemma by Mariah Ankman. So this follows uh, klutzy artist Tamsin, uh, when she is rescued by the hot and also commitment phobe uh, fireman Parker. Sparks may have flown between them a little bit, but the two find out that they are about to become step-siblings. Parker's mom is going to be marrying Tamsin's dad. Complications. Okay, so this was steamy. There was plenty of steam in this. Thank you, Mariah Ankman. Thank you. I have to admit, there were some exposition-y bits in here that did kind of feel like a little bit out of place, and Parker certainly growls things a lot to the point where I was like, yo, is he supposed to be a werewolf on top of a fireman? Because he just, he growls words. Like, why? Other than that, though, I, I really enjoyed this. It was a fun romp. Um, the characters themselves were pretty funny. Um, Tamsin is quirky as hell and I really enjoyed her. Uh, there was just a little bit of angst that I think was handled pretty well. Uh, like I said, the characters were interesting, the side characters were also interesting. I really liked learning more about the art Tamsin did, especially that one piece. Uh, if you've read it, you know. And also, say it with me healthy, consenting, adult sexual relationships. Yes, wonderful. We like to see it. Um, I gave this ultimately four stars. And that was it, guys. Uh, that was everything that I read in April. I, you know, had a pretty good reading month. Like I said, the reading slump is basically over. Hopefully. Um, already, I have been um, reading a couple of books. I'm already in the middle of a couple and it's only like, what is it, the third day of May. So that's also pretty good. Um, 
I hope that you guys enjoyed watching this. Uh, let me know if you read any of these uh, books down below. And yeah, I hope you guys are having a great uh, reading month so far. And I will see you in the next video. Bye!